Good morning, everyone, and it, it is uh, certainly a pleasure, and yes, it was a challenge uh, getting here. And as I spend a lot of time and energy around Common Core implementation, I always imagine two, three years from now, who didn't we talk to? Who didn't we think about when we we're thinking about this work of implementation? And certainly, thinking about this at the classroom level is a very important picture for us to keep in mind. So we'll go a little bit more um, in depth in some of the, the shifts that the commissioner shared with you, talk about what this actually looks like in class. We'll see a short video of a classroom where these things are already happening talk about what this looks like for students, and then also what does it mean for a teacher in their own practice, and hopefully fit in some time uh, at the end for questions with all of that as well. So thinking about this in terms of the shifts, these shifts don't necessarily encapsulate every requirement that is necessary in order to fully implement the Common Core standards. So if you can think about this as kind of describing the forest for the trees, it's a very important notion to understand. And one thing um, that we really are trying to push you know, whether it is the for-profit vendor community, whether it is foundations who are supporting the standards, whether it is parents who are supporting their students, we feel that more than knowing, you know, the, the details of every little expectation, to get this big picture sense of the changes that are ahead is a very important notion to have. So if you can imagine in literacy in these three things, prior to the Common Core, the majority of what students were reading um, K-12 was stories. And whether I'm speaking East Coast, West Coast, you know, Midwest, this notion of 90-minute sacred literacy blocks where we're spending a lot more time actually reading has been a very positive improvement across the country. But because 80% of what students are reading in that literature, in that literacy block is stories, we typically no longer have time in elementary school to teach science and social studies. And so part of the move of bringing back this idea of informational texts and so on is so that we can go to the shift to say that now what we're doing is we're building knowledge through text. So if you imagine elementary school students and the ripe opportunity to actually build knowledge of the world around them and the adventures, so to speak, that they could go on through reading about science and social studies topics. So that's the first shift, so that in elementary school, it's about 50-50 what students are reading. And by the time we get to middle school and high school, very important, it's about 75% informational text. And that's because it's part of the work of our science teachers and our history social studies teachers that we are, in fact, building literacy in those disciplines. We all know what it means to be a scientist, what it means to be a historian, is that we in fact have some proficiency in reading in the content area, in writing in the content area, very different from the reading and writing that happens in our English classes. The second shift that we're moving away from is a lot of time spent in our classrooms about writing about personal experiences, reflecting on our you know, outside world and bringing that into the classroom, not grounded in evidence. It's interesting conversation. It gets all the kids kind of participating and talking. But keep in mind that these standards were grounded in evidence. And writing about your childhood isn't really a college career ready skill. Instead, what the expectations call for in the standards is that when students are reading, writing, speaking, it's always pulling evidence from the text. So if you can imagine the question existing within a science class, a social studies class, a kindergarten class where they just finished reading a story out loud, what is the evidence that you just heard from the text that, give, that allows you to make that claim? That is the real move in the Common Core standard. So we often use the tagline of students start learning how to read like a detective and write like a reporter. That is a college career ready skill that hopefully most of you can recognize. Um, very different from the predominant form of writing that happens now in our school settings where they are writing much more personal uh, narrative. <clears throat> the third shift is this notion of what students are reading. And, and this is really quite a change to typical practice um, in our classrooms. So 
typically standards that preceded the Common Core really um, focused on the skills of reading and writing. You know, can you identify the main idea? Can you analyze the characters in a story? These kinds of things with very little consideration of what students were in fact reading. So whether or not you and I are college and career ready depends less on whether we can identify the main idea in a story or a story, a text selection or anything of the sort, but much more in with what level of complexity of text. And the research that was done to inform the standards found that the expectation of complexity and that's everything from the vocabulary and the sentence structure to the actual concept of what's being read. There was as much as a four year gap between what were students were reading in high school and what they were expected to read once they entered into a technical training program, college, or right into career settings. And so what these standards now include for a first time in, in most states is that every year there is kind of this staircase of complexity so that the, by the time students graduate high school, they're ready for the next step of complexity level of texts. Very different than common practice where you can imagine that you would walk into an elementary classroom and students are at all different reading levels and they're kept out of uh, appropriate complex text because of their reading level. So it's, uh, for example, that a student might be reading, you know, the, the topic of the day might be that students are considering baseball. And if you're a low level reader, you know, you have words in your story like ball, like bat, like base. And if you're a higher level reader, you have more sophisticated vocabulary. They talk about the rules, they talk about more, you know, the vocabulary is different. And the kids who are already struggling readers don't even have exposure to the very things that make strong readers strong. Rich text, rich vocabulary. And so the move that's expected of the Common Core is that all students, have regular practice with this complex text. There's still scaffolding strategies and so on, but we're not keeping kids out of those texts. And this is something that um, when states are considering professional development needs and that kind of thing across, you know, across the board, this is something that we're really going to need to think about and plan very carefully in because it is quite a shift in expectation uh, for literacy. So when we talk, <clears throat> throughout the country about the standards in literacy, those are the three main things uh, that we get people focused on. The idea that we're building knowledge from text, not just reading text and you know, moving on, we're, we're doing informational text as well. The fact that we're pulling evidence from what we read. And then finally, that what students read, more students are gonna be reading things that are at an appropriate level of complexity. And here's where I'm gonna get nervous, just for a second, because this is the video portion, the multimedia portion and I think if I escape and now I find the mouse and now um, <clears throat> there are a lot of really great partners out there who are looking to support people in the Common Core. So America Achieves is one such nonprofit um, who is at the work of collecting really great teacher advocates, great teachers working at this, and videotaping them. I mean, we all want to see. We would love to have gone into a classroom this morning, I'm sure, to see this. Um, and instead, I'll uh, show you a snippet of a video, and I can't tell you what a struggle it was to say, just five minutes, that's all I can show. But um, in the interest of keeping us on time, this is a video um, about a fifth grade math classroom, and we'll watch so today, Fortunate. what we're going to be learning about is volume. Yesterday, what you did was you definitely did the equation for volume. So you did length times width times height, which is really good because you had to get down the basic skill first. But now we're going to go one step deeper. We're going to actually figure out how to dissect a volume problem. So we're going to look at the problem and then figure out all the different things it's asking for and then use our skills to make sure we can go into it. So who can read the objective for me? By the end of this lesson, I will be able to measure volume by counting unit cubes using cubic centimeters, cubic inches, cubic feet, and improvised units and relate volume to the operation of multiplication and solving real world and mathematical problems involving volume. This one, you're going to have to think really hard about which ones were on there earlier. I expect you to get at least three of them. One of them we'll talk about. What are some units that can be used to measure volume? Yes, ma'am. Cubic 
centimeters. Good, cubic centimeters. You can write your name on the board. Good, cubic centimeters. Cubic meters. Cubic meters. That's a good one. I put that one on the board, but they can definitely put that one up there. Go ahead. Cubic meters. Yep. Cubic. Cubic inches. Cubic feet. Cubic feet. And there's one more that I haven't put up here, but I'm going to. And it's called improvised units. Do you remember that when we were talking the objective that said improvised units? Who knows what that means? That's a really weird word. Who knows what that means? What does improvised units mean? What does improvised units mean? Keelan, what's in here? Candy. Candy. Keelan, what if I didn't have centimeter blocks? What if I didn't have inch blocks or feet blocks? But I still wanted to figure out what the possible volume of this could be. What would I have to do? What is one thing I could do? I could fill it with? Small objects? I could fill it with objects, right? I could fill it with that many objects, and I could count them out. Ex Christian Brooks, you are on fire today. Give yourself two points. Excellent. The focus for this lesson really was looking at if we have a volume, how can we break it down into a length, a width, and a height to actually then be able to construct something? So the first day of volume is just figuring out what is volume, talking about that's like the, what's inside, and then the next day is like learning the actual skill piece of volume. So this is really a good third day lesson for volume, actually teaching them how to apply it. What are three ways we can find the volume? One, I know you know for sure. Yes, yes to my point. Good, you can use the formula length times width times height. Excellent, you can write your name on the board. So length times width times height is one. What are two other ways? Oh, you can put a check by your name. Yeah. Yes. Area times height. Good, yeah, the base times the height. Good, area times the height, excellent. So now we have two ways to find volume. We need one more. You can pack a right rectangular prism with unit cubes. You can use the equation volume equals length times width times height. You can also use the equation volume equals base, which is what Keelan was talking about before. So area times the height. And if you already know how to find the base, you don't have to fill in this part. But if you need a quick reminder, make sure you fill it in. Shania, which one do you want to do? The first one. Excellent. So if you're doing the first one, tell me what the length is. The length is 20 centimeters. Excellent. What's the width? 10 centimeters. And what's the height? 30 centimeters. Excellent. So how am I going to figure out what the volume is? You have to multiply the length times width times height. So can you do it in your head? I don't know. 20. So what should she be doing for this problem, though? Multiply 20 times 10 first. It is? Get 200. 200. And then she would put in what? Uh, times 30. 30. But does she need to deal with all those zeros? Yeah. No. So what would I have to do to figure this out? Multiply 3 times 1 times 2. Good. I multiply 3 times 1 times 2 is? 6. And then what do I do with all those pesky zeros? Add them. Add them on the end. How many are there? Three. I like how you're looking at that computer. 3. So what is it going to be? 600 centimeters. If I added 3 zeros, what is it going to be? I mean, 6,000. 6,000. Excellent job. But just 6,000 centimeters by themselves? Centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed. Excellent. It was really important for me for my students to understand that volume is just an application of multiplication. So having the multiplication skills was, I mean, fundamental for my students to be able to actually complete this lesson. So what do I need to do to figure out a missing measurement problem? Who can tell me? Yeah. Multiply your two numbers first and then see what you came up first and then see how much you need after you multiply your two numbers. So we have the length. What else do we have? The width. The width. Good. What are we missing? The height. I feel like we're always missing the height, though. And then what else do we have? The volume. The volume, the volume which is? Nine. Just by itself? Just inches alone? Cubed. cubed. Oh, inches cubed. OK. Now, what do I have to do to figure this out? Multiply the length times the width. Thank you for identifying what they are. Good. You multiply the length times the width. So what are you multiplying? What numbers? 32 times 3. What's 32 times 3? Oh, look at how I've just written this wrong. What's 32 times 3? 96. Uh, ooh. Can we give him a round of applause? A round of applause. I feel like he deserves a round of applause for that. That was excellent. Yes, 96. So 96 times whatever this missing height's going to be is going to get me to 960 inches cubed. So how am I going to figure out the height from here? 96 times what is going to get me to 960? 10. Yeah. How did you know that? How did you know? Because 96 times 10 is 960. There you go. It's 960. Excellent job. 
This is a giant candy bar, and yes, it is probably Keelan's. <laughs> the volume of this candy bar is 18 cubic feet. What is a possible length, width, and height of this candy bar? Keelan, can you imagine if you had a candy bar that was 18 cubic feet? I was thinking about that as I wrote it. Good job. What do I already have? What has already been given to me in this nice problem? Yes, Ms. Portia? The volume. A volume. But that, what does that mean I'm missing then? You're missing the height, the width. I mean, yeah, the height, the width, and the length. I'm missing them all, aren't I? So I'm missing the height. I have no idea what the height is. I have no idea what the width is. And you're right, I also have no idea what the length is. Interesting. So how am I going to figure that out? The one really important thing for people to understand about Common Core is it's just a mindset shift. It's not so different from what we've been doing for years and years, but it's different in terms of thinking about the how, how you teach it, what you're presenting to students, how deep you're willing to go with them. So as we transition now to talking about the math standards, I want you to keep that picture in mind of that lesson and we'll kind of highlight some of the things that make that uh, a Common Core lesson. So in math, um, as was mentioned this morning about this broad set of expectations, often described as a mile-wide, inch-deep curriculum that we have in this country, every week we're seeing a new topic. And one of the things, just as an example, that I have done this year for my own children is I started scanning their homework every night and have used it actually in some of my presentations where you can just see a slideshow where it's like, Today we're telling time on clocks, and tomorrow we are counting cupcakes, and the next day we're and it's just amazing how quickly we go through all of these uh, topics. Uh, a few weeks ago, I walked my daughter to the bus stop, and she said, Mom, is it Monday today? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, thank God we're done with fractions. And it's just like, make it till Monday, make it till Monday kind of thing. And no matter where we are um, with math, there's always something else. So very different from the expectations uh, that exist in the Common Core, which is to say we're taking like 113 separate topics in math, and we're figuring out and expecting what it is that students need in order to build strong foundations for the next grade. So what you saw in London's, um, London Moore is the name of the teacher, what you saw in her lesson, was that a lesson in multiplication? Was that a lesson in you know, geometry and measurement? Uh, was that even, as it was getting toward the end of the lesson, even you know, kind of a pre-algebra where we had variables and that kind of thing, but we're constantly revisiting the same thing, getting deeper and deeper, not, you know, I don't, won't you know, presume to know what goes on in every classroom in Tennessee, but a typical maneuver might be, we're doing you know, volume calculation this week. So take out your calculators and calculate length times width times height instead of taking the opportunity to reinforce the skill of multiplication as we're getting to application. We can do that because we have narrowed the expectations of concept with, student, with students, with teachers, we can get deeper. We could never have done that before to think about understanding math concepts, think about applying it to real world situations and building fluency in kids, which we'll talk about in a moment, if we still had 113 topics from September to June. So this first move is critical, um, that we're gonna focus strongly. I will tell you, um, as I, I guess the commissioner was the one that said, Teachers are not so willing to do this. A big study just came out last week um, from Michigan State that Bill Schmidt did. He was one of the, actually his research in some of these international math studies was very informative in influencing the standards. And 90% of the teachers interviewed loved the core. And only a quarter of them were willing to change things that they are currently teaching as they implement the Common Core. So one of the ways we talk about this is very powerful, that we encourage people to use the power of the eraser as they're thinking about uh, moving forward with the Common Core. The second um, is that, as I mentioned, we have all these scattered topics. We go one to another to another. We don't ever presume as teachers that students actually are building knowledge in math along the way. Um, and so we have these scattered topics. I mean, my observations just anecdotally as a mother. 
You know, we're teaching time the week after we give second graders a taste of fractions. When we tell them what a half an hour is, do you think we look at a circle and say half? You know, like we just learned about fractions, half, half an hour, no connection, no coherence. We don't make that move. When we um, teach the multiplication, we drill, we drill, we drill, we can't um, assume that kids come to us when we teach them division with any kind of foundational knowledge in multiplication. So when we teach them division, it's like a whole new thing. You know, my daughter in third grade, I told her I was going to give her a gift and require her to know her multiplication facts this year. I kept telling her she would be happy, she would be so thankful. She was my kid and we were investing this time in knowing multiplication and I remember her telling me, oh mom, next week we're doing division. And I'm thinking, she is gonna come home so appreciative of her mother. She already knows division because she knew multiplication and the teacher presents, you know, nine times five is 45. So, okay, we knew that already and the first division problem is 45 divided by five and the teacher said, Subtract five, subtract five again, subtract five again, subtract five again, and then you can figure out how many fives there are in 45. And she said, Mom, it takes up so much paper. You know, do we really have to do it that way? And so instead, this idea of when you get deeper, when you build understanding, this picture of what does six times six look like, then students can start um, getting deeper, understanding, and you can see how, for the first time, math can make sense to kids. I am telling you, we don't teach math expecting that it should make sense to kids. And what would make sense when you're thinking about a new topic every two to three, three to five days, we don't have time for the luxury of sense making. So in these standards, we are thinking across grades. How does what we learned in second grade actually build in third grade? How does that build in fourth grade? And in the standards, that's already, as somebody said, baked in. It's already well addressed in there and also linking to major topics within grades. So students really work on calculating area during the year that we're really working with them on multiplication. They really work on whole number, adding whole number quantities in first and second grade because we're worry, working on adding whole numbers in first grade. So everything is linked so that my dream might come true, that kids actually become confident in math because we do expect that kids can understand the concepts ahead of them. Um, and then when we get to what it means to do rigor, this is like a very important uh, topic that depending on, you know, where you are in, you know, math education, we've had this kind of false choice between do we want kids to have their math facts down? And some people, you know, have tagged that as like the old fashioned math drills or do we want them to kind of understand math concepts, but we really don't care um, if they get the answer right or wrong so much. And so the new expectations in these standards is that all three are important. So that you have a very huge need for conceptual understanding. And I will confess that my daughter, again, uh, maybe a little bit too much information, we go out to dinner and the truth, you know, Dinner topic conversations, as I turn to her and I say, Ariana, great, you know your math facts, we're, we did really well with that. But if someone were to ask you, you know, what does multiplication mean? Why would you use it? You know, what would you say? I mean, what else would a mother ask a child at dinner, right? Um, and she had no clue how to answer me on that question. No idea. So she knew her math facts. She got all the time, you know, goals correct, but she didn't meet the standards of the Common Core because she wasn't able to describe the concept. And so you saw the cookie plate example that was shown. And so that is what attention to conceptual understanding, what attention to fluency buys you, is that third piece of math which is so important which is the rich application. And so if you can think about how this might happen in a classroom, you don't get really great at those cookie problems by asking a whole bunch of cookie problems. You get really great at those problems by knowing concepts of math, by having some fluency and some skills in mathematical procedures, and then give a student, you know, a real life concept and they can start applying their math to that. So some <clears throat> Uh, pictures now, a little bit of conversation about what this means for students. This idea of college and career readiness that we talked about with Park, you know, we can start talking about 
ki with kids at a very early grade about what it means to be ready. Like you are actually working at getting ready. That is important. I've been in conversations where people will say, yeah, but we wouldn't really tell fourth graders that, would we? I'm like, you're right, let's just keep it a secret and know the data that they're kind of not quite progressing so that they will be ready, or we can make that a very real part of our conversation. Um, I, it, I didn't want to get too kind of corny about this whole expect more, achieve more, but that's what this whole thing is about. I mean, if we can start telling kids, I believe you can do this, and we're going to start keeping you to that task, we're going to engage parents, we're going to engage all of you in this conversation, it's very important. And we're not just talking about let's prepare for the assessments at the end of the year, or let's prepare for the chapter tests, or let's get good grades on a report card, but let's start getting ready. Let's start, start getting ready for what is going to make us successful adults in the future is a very important thing. Um, and it's not just, you know, the top 15% of our class students are knowing their multiplication facts or are doing well on their test. Because one of the things that we didn't really talk about so much now is in the world of standards, it was a weird thing that standards didn't apply to all kids. I mean, it kind of goes counter to what standards are supposed to represent. But what we get by having few standards is that these are a set of standards that are expected of every student. So you get lots of time to teach multiple ways. You get lots of time to do interventions, formative assessments, go deep. Go even deeper with students who got it, you know, right away. But for kids who are still struggling, you don't have to just survive till Friday because Monday you have the pressure of the next topic. You can spend lots and lots of time building swimming pools, doing the things that are going to get kids proficient. And so knowing that from, from a kid's perspective that you're not off the hook, once Friday comes, is going to be a very big change in their educational experience. So taking the time to attend to that. Also taking the time that we're not just teaching kids tricks anymore. We're not just teaching them the strategies, you know, invert and multiply, the butterfly method, all of these things, you know, but we're actually taking time and investing in making sense out of it. It is just amazing to me, kind of seeing this from a parent's perspective, how we teach math at the beginning as if it's not supposed to make sense to kids. At the beginning, it's perfectly fine. I mean, I was a science teacher. I can't tell you how often parents would say to me, yeah, I wasn't a science person myself. My children will not be science people. It was actually a very interesting finding out of the National Math Advisory pa Panel probably about half a dozen years ago now that it's only in this country that kids are born with a gene or not that makes you good at math. Every other country believes if you work hard, you can do better. And, um, you know, I, I just can't tell you from, you know, I, I don't tell my children's school what I do for a living. I think I, they would lock me out of the building. Um, but sitting at the open house where the third grade teacher said, oh, third grade math, it is tricky tricky. Not like, I believe your kids can do it, we're going to work hard at this this year. You know, don't worry, it is tricky kind of thing. So this, th we set them up to say it's okay not to do well in math instead of really saying, you know, that we can do this. So that's a very different thing. Um, some have described it, Phil Darrow, one of, one of the math authors said, in this country what we do typically when we teach math is teach kids how to get to the right side of the equal sign. And you can imagine if you have so many topics to teach and you have to get through the curriculum, as a teacher, your best bet is efficient, quick, what's the easiest way I can teach my kids to get the answer in as little time as possible. It's not necessarily always conceptual understanding. It's not depth. That does take time. But now what we're doing is kind of what we've learned from some of our international uh, partners, competitors, which is to get kids good at math, they actually have to understand the concept of math. We, we're going to actually teach math, not strategies to get the answer. And that's really the big shift there uh, that you'll see in math. So some visuals of what this looks like is this is what math looks like pre-Common Core. Every year we get a little bit of everything moving year to year to year. Every year, you know, kindergarten. They start off with patterns in algebra, thinking that if you do blue, blue, red, blue, blue, red, blue, blue, red, blue, blue, blank, that that actually prepares you for algebra. Uh, when I was in New Jersey, people fought 
in the Common Core that we were taking pattern study out of it. Why? Because it's fun, kids like it, they're engaged, they do pretty well in it. The only topic in math that U.S. is number one in the world in, pattern study. <laughs> Not number one in algebra, right? So it was a great evidence-based argument for why, don't keep telling me this prepares kids for algebra because, you know, the evidence doesn't pan out. Very different from what the standards look like in the Common Core, which the labels are less important, but then to show that we don't just have four separate lanes of things that kids are working on, we're actually building understanding and the things that they study in kindergarten and second grade build to new concepts in third through fifth grade, so sixth through eighth grade we can start doing the real math that we just struggle with because kids haven't um, built a strong foundation in the earlier topics. So some other illustrations that I just think are so great to show descriptions. This is a place value problem, second grade, pre-Common Core, um, where you have to list hundreds, tens, and ones, and you get all of these numbers, and the kids hundreds, tens, ones. Now, you don't really have to get, I mean, do you understand how you don't really have to understand concept of place value to fill this out? you can come up with the trick, which is put the first number here, second number there, third number there, and you know, so that's, but this is a very typical, you could see this pretty easily, you don't have to look too far to find this example. This is another kind of pre-common core, this comes from um, a state assessment, not Tennessee's, not New Jersey's, but one that is ranked probably the best state assessment um, in the nation, and you have uh, four different parks and how many park visitors, and it asks you which park had the most visitors last year, and this is supposed to be tagged to place value understanding, but it's really like ordering numbers, right? So you don't have to know that the first number represents the thousands. You don't have to know anything about that, and so this also isn't a good way to get to place value. This is an example that we would consider as being common core lined make true equations, just that direction, you know, tells you something is uh, elevating there. Write one number in every space, draw a picture of it helps. 100 plus four tens, what's the number? Four tens plus 100, tricky. Out of order, right? Tricky. Or you could know place value and then it's not so tricky, right? Uh, 14 tens is 10 tens plus how many tens? And so you can see a couple of things that is important to notice. Second grade, first of all, if you spend time and energy knowing how important place value is, this is an expectation. If my students can do this, I'm pretty confident that they can understand place value, right? This is a great demonstration of that. But the other thing to note is you don't see paragraph long word problems here. These are pretty simple, straightforward, but they're good questions. So it's not that we're saying every day these, you know, build swimming pools and do these, you know, huge long application. This is Common Core also, very straightforward, very uh, simple questions uh, to show you. Some things that ca came from some early indications of the park item development contracting that's going out now, these are some of the examples that were in the contract that demonstrate how you would assess conceptual understanding. Write four fractions that are all equal to five. That's pretty interesting. As a kid, I think that would be a pretty interesting question to answer. Maybe I'm living in the ideal there for a bit. But I think that's much more engaging than what we typically ask kids to do. Which number is least and which number is greatest? That could be a multiple choice question. No problem with it being a multiple choice question. We can get good at that. It's the expectations that are really um, changing here. So these are kind of some flavors of what this might look like. So just so that we, we have time, am I close to my end? Two minutes. Okay, so what it means for teachers, I think I only have a couple bullets about this. We now know what is expected. When we had 131 expectations of grade, we all knew the truth was we didn't expect every teacher to teach every kid all of those expectations. Now we are very clear, these are the expectations at your grade. If you're a third grade teacher, fourth grade doesn't own these expectations, second grade doesn't own these expectations, you own these expectations in third grade, and from our conversations with teachers, they love that clarity. Conversations, you know, anecdotal comments are great. I know what to teach now, and my job is to do the how to teach it. I know no longer have on my plate figuring out what to teach. That's already kind of been set out there. We really need teachers to get very deep because it's not just, you know, survive till Friday. We need a lot of different ways for teachers to understand how to reach all kids in their class. 
ways to have shared practices with teachers in their school, in their district, in your state, in 46 states now that are sharing these expectations, we can talk about deepening toolkits, sharing resources, leveraging the energy that exists to get kids proficient here. New concept of what it means to engage students. I was so appreciative of the question about teacher evaluation and how this all pairs together. We've actually also been doing some really great thought about that, meeting with some really smart people about how we can send this message that it's not one more thing to do. But this idea of engaging students is another great example that we value in teacher practice. Can we imagine engaging students in something that's hard work? Not engaging students in something like, let's count how many colors of M&M are in the bag and chart that out. Because that's a typical lesson that if I know I'm getting observed, my kids are all going to be on task and they're all going to be happy and smiling. But it's not common core work. It's not engaging them in hard work worth doing. And so that's this idea of what does it mean to engage students. And really, um, something that I've kind of held on to is a comment I heard somebody else make, which is, as a teacher, a new definition of what it means to care about kids. It means, hmm, I expect more, <laughs> and you can achieve more. Like, I expect every one of my students is going to be able to master these standards. And I am going to do, as a teacher, what it takes to deliver on that expectation for you. Very different than, you know, I keep you happy, I make sure, you know, you're smiling every day, that you're not too frustrated, and not to say that I expect everybody to be mean teachers, no. That's not, you know, the, the counter to this. But the idea is that what it means to care about a kid is that you expect of them and you support them in reaching those expectations. Mm -hmm.